As many UCL students are coming towards the end of their time at UCL, it's also the end for UCL Provost and President Malcolm Grant. Pi TV caught up with the man himself, asking him about his legacy at UCL, his role in the NHS, and that famous moustache. Hello, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to Pi TV. Great pleasure. The first thing I wanted to ask was, obviously as you're leaving, um, it's been quite an eventful year for you. Uh, there's a lot of news in terms of the union, in terms of UCL. Would you say you're looking forward to leaving? Is it going to be a nice rest or do you think you'll actually be quite, quite upset? No, actually, I would say I've had 10 eventful years. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, there's nothing unusual about this year. This is the normal, mm -hmm. uh, the normal stuff that happens in a huge university like this. Mm -hmm. I know I hate the thought of leaving. Um, you, know, you, you, you do a job like this, and you, you just become so passionate about the institution. Mm -hmm. I, I, well, I don't know how you feel. I just feel UCL is one of the greatest universities on the globe. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah. you know, very strong, how should I put it, re really strong feeling of loyalty and commitment among mm -hmm. staff and students. So yeah. um, it's really quite sad to um, turn my back on that. Do you think that, that's what makes UCL quite special? Sort of. Yeah, you know, I, I think one of the curious things, and I, and I never really understood it, um, First of all, I was here as a law professor back in the 1980s, so mm -hmm. five years as a law professor. Mm -hmm. And I used to commute in, I used to live in Hampshire. And um, under those circumstances, you know, you have no real sense of the underlying strength of the institution. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went to Cambridge, and you know, Cambridge is a lovely city, beautiful building, small town, uh, and a strong sense of identity of all the staff and students with Cambridge, actually more with their college than mm -hmm. with the university. Mm -hmm. When, you, when I came back to UCL, I thought, gosh, you know, is it really going to be like a big metropolitan university, uh, a bit blank, and people commute in and commute out, and they do their job and they go home? And actually, the answer's not. You know, I found a much yeah, greater nice. sense of um, community here at UCL than I ever expected. Mm -hmm. I think one of, the, one of the things is, you know, it's, it's, it, people are really cheek by jowl. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a lot of people in mm -hmm. a relatively small area. Mm. Uh, and I can't walk across the quad without, you know, being accosted by somebody who wants to talk about, you know, why aren't I putting more money into that department or, or whatever. Uh, but that, that sort of sense of, of recognition and intimacy. Of no, UCL. no, no, absolutely not. You know, I think it's, um, you know, it's really important that if you're the province of an institution, mm -hmm. you're recognisable and visible and people want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Frankly, if people turned away and started running, then I know that things, <laughs> things weren't working well. So, you know, looking back over 10 years, I just cannot imagine a better job in the world. It's just a fantastic job. And um, the man who's going to succeed me, Michael Arthur, mm -hmm. I just think has um, the opportunity to um, come into a wonderful institution and mm -hmm. take it on to the next level. Yeah, you, uh, you mentioned obviously you've been at Cambridge before. Do you think UCL have we got the edge on Cambridge? Oh, absolutely. Yes? <laughs> absolutely. Well, they're very different institutions. You know, I mean, C Cambridge is... Um, has all the advantages of history mm -hmm. and, and good funding and you know, really beautiful buildings. And you shouldn't underestimate that. I think it's a, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful place for students to work. Mm -hmm. But it's not in the middle of London. No. You know, we've I, got the history here too. Yeah, we've got fabulous not quite history. As much, we're, we're just about, about 600 years short of Cambridge. <laughs> but um, what have we got in London? You know, you're right in the middle of the greatest city in the world. I mean, sometimes that's a, a, a real nuisance because mm -hmm. it's sometimes such a difficult city to navigate around. and I. Yeah, I sometimes feel that our students who arrive, you know, from rural England or from around the world, must find London mm. a really difficult place. Like me, I arrived from rural England. So. Where, where did you come from? Derbyshire, Peak yeah. District. So, uh, well, you, you, you are the epitome of the experience. I mean, it must be really difficult to arrive in London and to adjust yourself <laughs> to living in, in a big city where life yeah, just goes on all exciting, around you. Very exciting. It well. is very exciting. Uh, but yeah, but the other great thing, I think, if you, um, if you walk through the corridors of UCL, Mm -hmm. The population that you see is almost identical to the population you see out in the streets. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a white Anglo-Saxon enclave. and It's very easy for institutions outside London mm -hmm. to be very different in their socio-economic and ethnic mm -hmm. makeup. A thing I think is wonderful about UCL is its cosmopolitanism. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, UCL and, and the rest of London are sort of interchangeable in that respect. Definitely. So obviously you... Uh you love UCL, by the sounds of it. Um, can you think of a best moment? Obviously, you've got 10 years to choose from. Best moment <laughs> as provost of UCL. Oh, I think you're, you're asking me to look at a huge array <laughs> of, 
of things. I mean, one, one of the great things about this job is that it's different. Every day is just completely different, mm -hmm. and different stuff is happening. And I think one of the things that um, I personally feel really proud about is our setting up of a school. You know, mm -hmm. ha actually having an academy, uh, and you, you must go. I bet you haven't been there. To the UCL Academy? Yep. I haven't. I think um, Musical Theatre Society did a, a charity, yes, a sort of a volunteering event yep. there, and, so I'm um, aware of it. But to see the realisation of a thing that we've been dreaming about. I mean, mm -hmm. first got involved in this in 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, we went through a whole lot of battles uh, to get the funding, to get the site, uh, to overcome some, some, some local political objection to it. Mm -hmm. Just because, as an institution, I felt that we couldn't, and it was wrong, to sit around saying that state education in Britain is not good enough uh, to produce students to come to UCL. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of that discourse goes on, and the government says, well, you've just got to open your doors wider, and you know, if the students apply, you've got to let them in. And the real problem has been that um, uh, many of our schools have not been uh, encouraging students to have the aspiration to go to a great university. Mm -hmm. So we decided that um, the way to tackle that was for the university to have responsibility for a school, mm -hmm. and not just to do what we've always done, which is to have you know, Saturdays, students coming in to mm -hmm. UCL and our staff and students going out and working in schools, all of which is mm -hmm. great stuff, but to actually have real responsibility. Mm -hmm. So the UCL Academy, it bears our name. Mm -hmm. uh, we have set up a board of governors to, to, to run it. Mm -hmm. um, and you go into that school and you see two groups of children. Um, one are 11-year-olds and the other mm -hmm. are, are 17, 16-year-olds. Mm -hmm. uh, and extraordinary, the atmosphere, the ethos, uh, the sense of purpose, the mm -hmm. dedication, amazing. Again, completely cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. uh, the students are required to learn Mandarin. Uh, wow. That's their modern language. And so the staff will say, well, they would learn it as well. I mean, some of the staff, I think, are feeling quite um, daunted by that because they feel <laughs> that the students I are picking it up you know, far faster than they are. But for me, for a university, to found a school which will have 1,100 students mm -hmm. and um, really close interaction with the main departments at UCL mm -hmm. is a, an experiment in education for the future and we really want to try and encourage other yeah. universities to do the same. Yeah, so you think um, maybe that's the, the future of education? I think it is. Universities yes. sort of opening up their own schools. I almost. mean, it's impossible to imagine that every school, you know, 20,000 schools mm -hmm. in, the, in, in England uh, can have a, a sole university sponsor. Mm -hmm. But I think we can have here an experiment that can start to infect uh, the way in which people think about secondary mm -hmm. education for the future. Definitely. And try to overcome the gap that so many students feel between mm -hmm. school and university. Mm -hmm. you know, it's fine if you've gone to a school that has thought all the way through in academic terms, it's prepared you for university. Mm -hmm. uh, but so many of our schools don't. Mm -hmm. And so many of our schools um, don't prepare students to have either the attainment or the aspiration that mm. would get them into, not just get them into UCL, uh, but get them into a winning position in yeah. UCL in a, a pretty mm -hmm. competitive environment. Yes, it is definitely. <laughs> um, so obviously that's your, perhaps one of your, your best, not Well, I mean, there's lots, such, lots, lots, but, um, lots, lots of things. But I, something I, you're that, most proud of. Well, I'm proud one of it of because no other, no other university's done it. Yes. Uh, and I think it's another way of demonstrating the willingness of UCL community to mm -hmm. do something that's different, it's radical, mm -hmm. Uh, and it projects us out um, mm -hmm. as really taking an interest in things beyond our closed walls. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, uh, if you'll be able to give an answer to this now then. Um, is there a worst moment as Provost of UCL? Most I difficult would say moment? I would say um, about five years ago when we were facing quite serious funding cuts. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's stuff that... I mean, one of the things you have to do in a leadership role like Provost, I think, is to try to convey a sense of stability, mm -hmm. financial security, uh, and uh, the thing that keeps really high quality staff here is knowing that their future is secure mm -hmm. and that we're going to be able to invest in, in, in research and teaching. So we went through a period where um, I would say it was quite hard. Mm -hmm. uh, we, d we decided that we would have uh, an arrangement, no compulsory redundancies, but we would offer packages to staff to go, uh, and for every uh, three staff who, who, who left the institution, we would allow a department to appoint another one, mm -hmm. young blood coming through. We had to do it uh, to save money. And actually, it worked, mm -hmm. uh, and it did bring us through what was otherwise a really, potentially really difficult mm -hmm. funding crisis. You arrived at UCL, didn't you, when the sort of funding was quite a difficult, quite a problem at UCL. Yeah, I think they lied to me about it. Actually, <laughs> at the time. 
Uh, no, actually, they, they showed me the accounts, and UCL had been trading in deficit. Uh -huh. um, and it really wasn't clear how we were going to be able to turn that around. Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, university is not a business. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't operate according to the usual rules of um, uh, making a surplus and handing it out to shareholders. Mm -hmm. But in all other respects, you have to run it in a business-like manner. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say, you know, you have to make sure that every pound that's invested in the university is invested uh, for the greatest advantage of the students and the staff. So mm -hmm. you've got to try and cut out waste. You have to deal with underperformance. Um, but you also have to cover one of the real problems that we had then, which is that we were so good at research, and research can lose money if it's not properly mm -hmm. funded for overheads. Yeah. And so we were um, starting to pull ahead uh, nationally and globally on some of the really great research, but research and particularly in the medical field is often underfunded. Mm -hmm. So the irony was that along with Oxford, Cambridge and Imperial, um, the more successful we were in competitively getting in research money, the closer it drove us to insolvency. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, this was a perennial problem. It started to pick up um, about the mid-2000s when the government introduced new funding to cover overheads. Mm -hmm. And then we could start to see that, it's still not right, but we could start to see that um, yeah. we could start to, to balance the books. You, you've left GCL in quite a, a good uh, position for the new provost then. I, well, I think so. Um, but these things are never secure for long. We're in the middle of getting to the academic mission of the institution. Mm -hmm. that, that's what comes first. What, yep. what is it that makes UCL great? And I would say it's having the best quality staff, mm -hmm. and that attracts the best quality students. To get the best quality staff, you have to be really good at research. Uh, but you have to have staff who are not only good at research, but also good at teaching and mm -hmm. take, a, you know, I would say, a very personal uh, interest in, in the welfare of their students. Mm -hmm. And if you disrupt that ecosystem, mm -hmm. it's not difficult for a university to decline, um, yeah. sometimes um, quite quickly, sometimes over a longer period. Uh, so I think when Michael Arthur comes in, um, yes, he's, 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 he's coming into a fabulous job, um, mm -hmm. and I think he's got every opportunity to, um, to advance us from where we are. Mm. I mean, inevitably, after 10 years even, you know, and I, and I look at the, at the exit door and I think there's so much unfinished business, there's so much stuff I mm -hmm. would really love still to be able to do and to complete. Mm -hmm. uh, I was out this morning walking uh, down Harland Street where our new Sainsbury Welcome Centre for Neural Circuits is going up. Mm -hmm. And um, if you go up to St Pancras, the new Crick Institute uh, mm -hmm. for Biomedical Research uh, is going up. Neither of them mm -hmm. will be finished during my term of office. Uh, neither of them will open for probably another two to three years. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there's that frustration of knowing that you are only ever a steward uh, yes. for what, for <laughs> ten years' time. Uh, and I pass on to, to Michael Arthur and he... Yeah. As I did 10 years ago, he gets to open the buildings. <laughs> His predecessors had the responsibility for yeah. bringing forward. So you, you mentioned obviously sort of finances. That was maybe a, a problem that you faced when you arrived. Um, obviously, students as well face problems, uh, especially these days coming into higher education, um, especially perhaps obviously with the rise of tuition fees. Do you think, do you think that is the biggest problem? I don't think it's the biggest problem. I mean, I think employment uh, yes. is the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the tuition fee issue is, is a complex one. I think, actually, the, the problem with the tuition fee structure is probably that financially it's unsustainable for the government. Mm -hmm. um, and that is because of the, well, I won't go into detail, but the so-called RAB charge, which is how many students won't actually ever repay. Yes. Uh, and at the outset, I mean, I think the government assumed that it would be maybe under 30 percent. It's now looking more like 45 to 50 percent. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that it, it doesn't add up yeah. as a model. Uh, if um, each university owned the student debt, mm -hmm. uh, in UCL's case, I would have thought the RAD charge is probably under 15 percent. Mm -hmm. um, that your students here will actually subsidize students uh, elsewhere who, who, who never will repay. Yeah. Uh, so I think that what we had, I think, feared was that the introduction, the move from 3,300 to 9,000 would deter a lot of students from going to university. Mm -hmm. The jury's out on that. Um, we've got a natural reduction anyway in the age, sorry, in the number of university age students because mm -hmm. of demographics. That will yeah. start to rise again by about 2020. 
uh, uh, but the propensity to go to university is largely undiminished, mm -hmm. particularly under the lower income within the lower income yeah. groups, which was which was our greatest fear. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the government um, was not successful uh, in getting the message across that it is actually a mm -hmm. deferred graduate repayment scheme yeah. as opposed to an upfront fees system, and still many teachers and students think they have to pay nine thousand pounds a year up front. Yeah, you do have to pay it back eventually, though, unfortunately. Yes, you do, but, it, but the Australians did it by calling it a graduate, a graduate contribution. A high, it was a higher education contribution, a heck. Mm -hmm. um, and politically, uh, that, that was found to be rather more acceptable than calling it a tuition fee. Mm. Um, I mean, the real, sorry, the real problem, just continuing on this, um, is that um, you know, there's a lot of political discourse saying, well, why don't we have a, a tax? Yes. They pay it through the tax system mm -hmm. uh, rather than through a loan. Mm -hmm. And actually, in many ways, that's pretty much what we've got yeah. um, because it is paid as a, as a proportion of income in the, and through the tax model. Mm -hmm. The real problem with designing it as a tax system is that you couldn't recover a tax outside the jurisdiction of the UK. So for EU yeah. students, mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't have worked, and, yeah. um, but whereas the loan recovery model does. Mm. So I suppose maybe that's one of the problems that Michael Arthur might face. The, more general well, you won't face it alone, you'll face it alongside yeah. 110 other vice chancellors. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to move on to something perhaps a bit more light hearted. Um, it's, uh, you've been known to attend quite a few student productions over your, over your time here. Um, I wondered if, uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of student productions now, hoping that you choose theirs. Is there any that, are there any that stand out? Oh, yes, I think so. Actually, well, my problem is I'm an opera fan. Uh, and I think UC <laughs> Opera is just fantastic. I went this year to, they did really difficult opera um, mm -hmm. by Verdi called mm -hmm. I Lombardi. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, Ver I'm going to get on, I'm going to get boring. <laughs> uh, so it was Verdi's third opera. He wrote it when he was about 30. Uh -huh. But it was after Nabucco, which was you know, one of his most famous operas. And uh, I Lombardi is very rarely performed. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of awful lyrics in it. But actually the music is just sublime. So... Um, uh, it was really ambitious for a student opera company to put on something of that complexity. Mm. So, uh, with my wife, we've gone practically every year to mm -hmm. UC Opera. Mm -hmm. I just totally bowled over <laughs> by it. Any, any others? You've been converted oh, to any other Oh, yeah, styles? I've, been to, I've been to dance uh -huh. um, and, and one or two of the other events. Um, uh, and actually, I think the, all of them just demonstrate what, what, what really, sorry, this is sound awful, what really talented students we've got, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> And when you consider that um, all of these people are doing a degree at the same time, uh, yeah. it's amazing. I, know, you know, I saw a lot of it in Cambridge because every college has its own music society. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of emphasis on music and sport in mm -hmm. Cambridge. But um, again, UCL surprised me when I came here to find that it's exactly the same here, but without a music department. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe it's almost... Um, cause and effect that if you haven't got a music department yeah, there's, no, there's not a group to, of professionals yeah, who you have to dedicate all your time to yeah. a sort of music society if you've not got the uh, if you're not doing it as a degree but you're passionate about yes, it yes absolutely um so obviously it seems like the the arts the performing arts are something that you are interested in there was a, a rumor this year that um the garage theater was going to be taken away obviously it's, it's not the bloomsbury theater the garage mm -hmm. theater is the the smaller more intimate theater uh, and there was a rumour that UCLU societies were going to lose that. I think it was going to be taken over by architecture. And um, certain people said that you stepped in personally to stop that from happening. Can you, can you confirm? Well, no, I couldn't confirm or deny. I would give, I'd give the credit to the Dean of Architecture, okay. uh, Alan Penn. Because as you know, we're refurbishing all of Waits House. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a major project. And um, the garage theatre is in the far corner in the basement. Mm -hmm. And it's not a big... Uh, part of, 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 of architecture. I mean, what I feel bad about still is I don't think we have got anything like the quality of student facilities that we need mm. as a modern yeah. university. I mean, the garage theatre is fine, but, you know, it's a bit grotty. It's very uh, small. Yeah, yeah. And, the, you know, there's, I, the Bloomsbury Theatre is a huge mm. uh, benefit to us, um, but we can only really use it for student events for a limited time of the year. And that's not financial, it's just that that's the only time a students are ready uh, yeah. to put on, put on performances, mm -hmm. which tends to be you know, February through to yeah. April. Uh, but um, we are planning, you know that vacant site next to the Bloomsbury Theatre? Yes. It's an empty site. Uh -huh. uh, that's going to be a brand new student centre. Uh, so we're really well advanced on plans for okay. that. 
and um, I will, hope will that be taking will that be taking space from any anywhere else from sort of departments? No, I hope not. I'm trying to fight off some deans who would like us to put more formal teaching space in there. Mm -hmm. But I was really transfixed about back in January. I went to um, Hong Kong as I do quite regularly to sit on a committee there, and I went around Hong Kong University's new student commons. Mm -hmm. and it's a building. That's absolutely fantastic. So it's got space for students, totally um, occupied by students, but it, with, with a series of settings which range from the quite formal, you know, like a library setting with chairs and desks, mm -hmm. all, all IT wired, etc., uh, to stuff which is really informal with bean bags and a bank of TV screens, mm -hmm. and you can just tap on your iPhone and listen to whatever's on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, and people can sit there and have coffee, lean back, chat to people, lots of noise, lots of buzz. Mm -hmm. Then you go through a succession of different rooms, completely different atmosphere, and students, they track the student movement during the day. Mm -hmm. And it's clear people work in different environments at different times mm -hmm. on different projects, some in groups, some in singly. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, that is the, the, the real model for the future, mm -hmm. not formal seminar rooms and tutorial rooms, of which we've got you know, a number and we obviously carry on using, mm -hmm. um, but which are much less flexible and spaces for, for students to learn. Yeah. So when we do the student centre and also review uh, the whole of the central library, uh, I think we'll move much more to that model. DMS Watson is a, is a mini culture, if mm -hmm. you like, of, a, of, a, of, a, of that model. Yeah, but the hope is we won't be Obviously, there's been criticism that maybe I think archaeology might be losing um, academic office space and that sort of thing to create this student centre. Um, the hope is that it, it won't affect negatively on the, the teaching staff. Yeah, I mean, we've, I, you're absolutely right. There's, it's quite a difficult um, mm -hmm. call to make. We occupy probably the most expensive real estate of any university in the world, mm -hmm. uh, and it's quite difficult to you know, factor the opportunity of that cost of that into everything that we do. Mm. But um, uh, I think there are some aspects of our work which can be done in open plan offices. I mean, the whole of our administration now is in open plan mm -hmm. office that works really well, because you can see who's in, go and talk to them. It's more difficult, I appreciate, for academics. Mm -hmm. um, and having been an academic myself for many years, you, you're trying to write a book. Mm. Uh, the one thing you do not want is any, any sort of distraction at yeah. all. Um, another slightly controversial issue that's uh, come up recently is your role in the NHS, your chair of NHS mm. England. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I wanted to ask was, uh, you mentioned recently that maybe uh, the NHS might have to implement charges for certain services in order to to balance the books, I suppose. Um, do you think that obviously we've got rising tuition fees, we've got potentially charges coming in for the NHS, do you think that while that might help the economic situation of the UK, it might leave certain members of the UK population sort of left behind almost because they can't afford those sort of things? Well, let me go. What I actually said, um, and it's in the FT, was that a future government may have to look at charges. It's not. It's not in my remit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, well, first of all, a few words about the NHS role. I mean, this this I think is the most difficult role mm. ever. Since 1948, when the NHS was founded, uh, the level of taxpayer investment in it has gone up by four percent real a year, every year, mm -hmm. and the level of demand has been going up by between four and five percent. Uh, from now on, we know that it's not going to go up by 4 or 5% in, in, in investment. It's going to be flat real is all that the government can provide. Because mm -hmm. um, the NHS now consumes 23% of our, all of our investment in public services. Mm -hmm. So the government is left with a very limited set of choices. One is we, now NHS England, start tackling a number of the issues mm -hmm. uh, around um, best use of investment in the NHS, and that's what mm -hmm. we're getting on with. Mm -hmm. um, huge number of things that we can do, and there's now a real willingness, I think, amongst clinicians and in hospitals, GPs, to try and resolve some of the really acute dilemmas and paradoxes in the NHS. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll hear a lot of it in the media now. One, one, of, one of the issues is um, that a system that was designed uh, for acute care, that is for people who suffer injury or, or, or illness, mm -hmm. um, is now having to deal with an ageing population uh, who have long-term conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, diabetes, increasing incidence of dementia, um, and, and, and conditions which they will live with. Certain types of cancer people will die with rather than off prostate cancer being, being, being an obvious example. 
but we're trying to re-divert the resources to care for this population, uh, many of whom are, are, are at the moment in hospitals with no medical reason for being in hospital, other than that there is not the necessary care in the community where people would rather be and people. I think as, as people get older, they would much rather be living at home, especially adapted and with nursing care, than mm -hmm. living in an expensive hospital ward. So there's an enormous amount of work to do on that front. We think we can you know, redo some basic reform of the NHS, but we do it because we're completely non-political. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as the politicians stand up and make a comment about, uh, let's say, the performance of GPs or hospitals, then a politician on the other side comes back and counters it, and we get mm -hmm. into... I think a really difficult area of political mm. slanging uh, over the NHS as opposed to mm. our, our new system that we're trying to implement which is clinician led. Yes. So I now mm -hmm. invite our medical director for England to go out and speak for us. So mm -hmm. if we're talking about the future of accident and emergency departments, it has to be clinicians who guide mm. it rather than politicians. So I think that the prospect of, of a government introducing charges is, is, is relatively remote as long as we okay. su can succeed on, on what mm -hmm. we want to do. Mm. The alternative in a stagnant economy is to, is to raise tax mm -hmm. and that's, that's really popular amongst the population, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that isn't going to happen. Mm. A lot of countries do charge, I mean most of the rest of the world does have some form of charge mm -hmm. but then they have an insurance backed system that yes. repays it uh, for people who um, are, are less well off. Mm. Um, you admitted recently, actually, that you, you don't actually use the NHS. No, I didn't. No, what, what I said, I'm not a patient, by which I okay. meant I'm not receiving, thank goodness, I'm not receiving any form of medication okay. at all. Uh, my wife is an NHS doctor, right? Uh, which actually helps. Yes. <laughs> so, um, no, but I don't have private health insurance. I wouldn't use anything other than the NHS. Okay, um, so maybe misquoted yeah. slightly. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, along a similar lines as healthcare. Another sort of big issue that's come up this year is the, the Gower Place practice, um, mm -hmm. which uh, it's been reported that the lease, is, the contract isn't going to be renewed. Um, can, can you elaborate at all on why that decision yeah, was sure. made? Yeah, no, I mean, the, let's start by saying it's not a proposal to close the Gower Place practice. Mm -hmm. um, it's an NHS practice, it's not a UCL practice. Mm. It has to be an NHS practice because that's how it gets its funding. Mm -hmm. uh, we provide funding for it in addition for services that it provides to students. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's based in a building which is, I think, and I think is a general feeling, is, is really not fit for purpose for the future. Okay. Uh, up on the upper floors, not mm -hmm. readily accessible. Uh, we would pr far prefer with the uh, three partners of the practice to find alternative accommodation more readily accessible and also capable of growing. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, oh, I haven't got the exact figures to hand, but there's, I think, about 13,000 patients registered with yeah. them. That, that would be about right for, 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 their, for their covering numbers. And they do provide a very good service mm -hmm. for, for students and, and for staff, particularly at exam time. Yes, definitely. You know, when, when pressure is up all over mm. the place. Um, but what we're wanting to do, and we are working with them to try and find other premises where they can locate to, mm -hmm. which would give them modern, accessible premises and... Um, uh, an ability to register more students if they wanted. So the hope is that there, there maybe wouldn't be a sort of a gap in between where there's, there's not... Well, there can't be a gap. No. Yeah, there simply can't It will be. keep running until yes. another, another yes. location suitable yeah. is found. Yeah. Okay. Um, but actually the complication of that is that it has to be... It has to have gra separate ground floor access. This is NHS yeah. rules. Mm -hmm. um, so we couldn't, um, for example, put it in, in an existing building that simply had the one access. I, mean, I think it's quite right for clinical purposes that mm -hmm. you know, patients should have a separate yeah. uh, entry point from others. Mm -hmm. But that actually makes it quite difficult mm -hmm. to find the ideal property. Okay. Um, that's obviously that's been one of the, uh, the things you've been criticised on by UCLU. Um, and a lot of students have uh, noticed this year a sort of, a, I think it'd be fair to say, a growing hostility between you, perhaps the, the full-time officers this year and yourself, which has played out in the Provost newsletters and UCLU. Oh, I thought I'd been really kind <laughs> in, the, in, in, in the Provost newsletter. Um, no, I mean, I have to say, over the 10 years, I have had, there have been some fantastic mm -hmm. sabbatical officers. I mean, you know, students who really care about the institution work really hard for students. I mean, a absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. people. Uh, and I have to say, I have respect for people by what they do rather than by what they profess. Mm -hmm. you know, judge sabbatical officers by what they achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say that people who are paid 
uh, quite handsomely mm -hmm. uh, have to behave professionally and, and deliver against mm -hmm. that. And that's the role of Pi as an investigative mm -hmm. organ. Uh, uh, well, where else I mean, in politics? Mm -hmm. Who holds the politicians to account? Mm -hmm. Not the electorate. The media. It's the media. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do feel that um, you know, where, where, where there are issues, it is one of the responsibilities of the media to, to investigate them and to hold uh, elected politicians to account. I mean, look, look at the turnout. Uh, it's quite, it's quite remarkably low, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know whether a student body generally has any interest uh, in student politics. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. I, I mean, I suppose uh, maybe it's one of those things that if students think it's, it's running itself, or a lot of students at UCL maybe are focused solely on their, on their degree. So uh, obviously, it's very difficult. Or their dance, degree. or their opera, or their sports, or yeah, other bit. activities. Yeah, I, guess I mean, I think the clubs and society sabbaticals have been very effective over the years. I mean, that's obviously a major area of activity. Mm -hmm. But again, I think you know we. Uh, I'm very clear with any member of staff we appointed on a salary like that, we would have certain expectations and we would look at performance and we would talk at them and develop them as, as, as highly professional people, mm. securing maximum value for students mm. and, and, yeah. and, and for colleagues. So surely the same should apply to mm -hmm. sabbatical officers. Does it, does it bother you a lot uh, when you sort of read the... the well, I have to say, on the grand say. panoply of things I'm worried about, <laughs> though, uh, no, I think what... What I think we could improve is the representation of students, not, th not through that rather narrow channel, but much mm -hmm. more across the board. Yeah. And uh, we've been working quite hard on that, particularly around you know, what goes into the new student centre mm -hmm. and trying to engage student opinion yeah. on that. And again, going back to the Hong Kong experience, they obviously did that really, really effectively, and mm -hmm. I think we can learn from that. Yeah. Um, one of the sort of, uh, coming towards my, my last questions now, um, we've mentioned a bit about what your best moment was, what you're really proud of. Um, perhaps your answer might be the same. Um, what you hope your, your legacy will be at UCL. Obviously, you said you're, you're a steward for 10 years. But yes. Obviously, you do make a, you make a substantial all, mark in that. Yeah, but it's all time. that you are as a steward. And um, I mean, you can look at legacy in, in a lot of ways that don't really mean much. I mean, you can look at the new buildings and mm -hmm. you know what we've done to improve buildings. You can look at the increase in in research income which has doubled, student numbers have gone up, but um, actually in 20 years time when people look back on it, how would I like them to think of, of my tenure? Mm -hmm. I think as, as a time of, of, of growth and improvement and excellence. Mm -hmm. I think that, that's what it's about. The, the buildings are symbols, the money is a symbol, uh, but it's the real quality of the institution and I think yeah. um, um, that with the fabulous senior team that we've got here, which is the other great you know, legacy that I give to Michael Arthur, uh, then there's every opportunity for it to continue. Okay, um, and I wanted to finish on perhaps uh, another light-hearted question, I uh, finish on a high. Um, you're very famous for your, for your moustache. Is that, <laughs> is that true? Um, yeah. um, in 2005, I think you, you shaved it off for, for, uh, yes, on the request yes. of the cheese grater That's for the charity. Right. Yes. Um, do you think you might be doing anything like that in, in No, the I don't. No, no, no. no. Permanent no, it was quite fun actually, but it does regenerate. Uh, <laughs> it does regenerate yeah. quite quickly actually. No, I've I've had it. I'm really quite fond of it actually. My wife refused <laughs> to allow me to shave it off. Um, but I've, I've, so she I've, wasn't very happy I've, in I've, I've, had, I've, had it, I've had it since I was about 20. You remember when I was about 19 or 20, the, the, I mean, the fashion was long hair. I had it down to my shoulders. <laughs> and it was a Frank Zappa moustache, which was black in those days. Well, so was the hair, actually. Okay. Uh, and, and, and it just looks so, so completely mad. Uh, today, so I hope when you look back on you know, forty years' time as to how you look now, you won't have those same emotional responses to it. But you, you kept something from that from that uh, that approach. You kept the moustache. I kept the moustache, but not but not the long hair. Okay. Well, thank you very much for talking thank to you, us Hayley. today. It's been a pleasure to come. Um, I hope you enjoy watching it. Uh, I hope you do watch it. Yes, I've been. Yes, yes. And uh, yeah, it was lovely to speak to you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.